Hey everybody, Coach E here with Dr. B. Welcome to another episode of Ask Dr. B Live. Dr. B, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm uh, enjoying this gorgeous weather again. We're just so lucky this summer. It's been amazing. Uh, not too much humidity right now, so it's uh, great to be outside and playing some tennis. And um, yeah, I'm really life is good. How about you? Nice. Um, yeah, I'm okay. Dealing with some kid stuff this morning, some drama. Oh, <laughs> uh, which is why I was a bit late getting on, but uh, all is well. I think they'll survive, no and uh, we can get into it. So today we are following up on last episode, where you presented on shoulder pain and injuries, specifically rotator cuff stuff, impingement, those kind of common shoulder issues that people run into, and we had so many great questions that we wanted to answer them for people, and we just didn't. We ran out of time last week. Mm -hmm. So today we're dedicating to Q&A on the shoulders and we're going to dive into that in just a moment. Um, before we do, one note to everybody watching, if you're here, if you submitted a question last week in the chat, we should have it captured. So you should be good. Just tell us that we're, you're here. And if you submitted a question via the form, again, just tell us you're here and uh, just so we know. And if there's any follow-up back and forth, then just leave your comments in the chat and we'll, we'll interact that way. Um, now, before we get into it, I just wanted to share, Dr. B and I got out to play a little bit of tennis on um, Monday, I guess it was. And I just wanted to share, I took a little video just to show you some skills that Dr. B has. So check this out. Right there, so phone should be coming up in a moment. Can you see my, uh, my screen there okay? Yeah, I can see I'm sweating. Oh, you're, you're, you are sweating pretty hard. It was yep. pretty warm that day. Okay, Eric so making here's just, me run. <laughs> here's just one sequence. You're already sweaty by the time I got there. <laughs> the doctor be serving. Nice little rally. Yeah, yeah, lots well, then, of boom. Fun. I'm gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think either one of us expected that one. <laughs> that was a nice shot. <laughs> oh my god, uh, it's so much fun playing with you. Like it's really funny for me because I, I play like I play a lot, you know, four or five times a week. And I think Eric, me, what do you play? Like five times a year, or five times a summer. Yeah, that was yeah, that was my second time out this year. And you're incredibly good. Like, oh my gosh, if you ever play more than you know once a week you're going to be out there killing everybody you're so fast you see the ball so well i mean i'm just so impressed uh, <laughs> it was really really fun so i can't wait to get back out there with you thank you yeah i'm looking forward to it too and so many of your tips helped um just the little things that you mentioned definitely helped right away it was awesome so um yeah i just like to share that stuff too just to show people that um like i'd like to do it with myself sharing videos and me doing sports or whatever, whatever it is I like to do. Uh, just so people know that we're, we're active people. We like to stay active. It's not just, you know, talking about getting out of pain just to get out of pain, but it's to get out of pain so you can do stuff. You know, life is super fun when you're moving and when you're able to do the stuff that you like to do. Yeah, for, oh, for sure. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little older than you and um, I'm actually going to be 61 in a few weeks. And um you know, the, the beauty of what we're doing and, and what I'm learning all the time, but what I love is I get a little ache or pain and I change how I move and the pain goes away and I'm still able to move. And that's my goal because I just love being active and playing sports. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, this show, we're able to share our passion for this and keep other people moving. That's really the goal. And we've had some fabulous questions. So uh, why don't we shoot? What's next? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's dive in. And actually just, I'm glad that you actually shared your, your age on here. Um, because I, I think it's just such an awesome thing to see, you know, 61 year old killing me in tennis. Like that was a great shot that if people don't play tennis to take a, to take a shot like that off of a ball in the air is and going cross court when I'm charging the net is pretty impressive. Um, wow. so just goes to, it's a testament to, to you walking the talk. And I think that's so important that people see that you walk the talk and 
you're not just talking about it, but you're living it as well. Mm-hmm. All right. So everybody, we are going to dive into some questions. Um, I see we're going to start off with one off the uh, sheet here that I had from Alex last week. Uh, and then I'll get into the chat. Hi, Dr. B. Do you have any experience with what I think is shoulder subluxation? Um, I know you do have experience with that one. Um, mm-hmm. At certain angles, I get a short and very sharp pain that feels like it's sliding out of the joint and back in. Okay, so yes, I do have lots of experience with subluxation and subluxation is actually a really common issue in shoulders, so particularly for people under the age of 30, if they have any signs of hypermobility. Um, and the key here, when you think about stability of the joint is understanding that there are static stabilizers. So that would be things that aren't moving, but the, the shape of the bones, like the shape of the bones don't change the ligaments that are around the shoulder help to act as a check rein and prevent the loss of the normal alignment of the ball and the saucer in the shoulder joint. And then we have the dynamic stabilizers, which are um, the muscles and the nervous system, the little proprioceptors that are within the joint capsule and in the muscles themselves. And the, um, uh, in, for people who have subluxation issues, one of the most critical things is to train proprioception or change, train the position sense. So first of all, you have to make sure that the rotator cuff muscles are turned on because that the, the job of the rotator cuff is to keep that ball centered on the saucer, no matter where your arm is positioned in space. And we'll, we'll find that you'll have a vulnerable range of motion where that subluxation will occur. And so what you should do is really make sure that your cuff is turned on as you approach that range. So say, um, and just let me know if my mic, I've pinned it down, but I'm, when I'm moving my arm around, I hope it's not. Good. Uh, okay. So if you can see my shoulder, most people will subluxe anteriorly when they bring their arm into abduction and external rotation. That means that the humeral head will slide a little bit out the front. If your problems occur more when your arm is coming across your body and your thumb is turning down, uh, that's internal rotation, adduction, and some flexion that uh, can lead to posterior subluxation of the shoulder. So there are little, slightly different parts of the cuff that are asleep for the anterior subluxation versus the posterior subluxation. But all four members of the rotator cuff, the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor do have to get their act together and work in concert to keep that ball centered on the saucer. So before you go out and you do your activity, what I recommend that you do is you turn on your rotator cuff muscles and Eric has got some great exercises. What would be your favorite exercise to turn on the rotator cuff before you're gonna go do a sport? Or uh, I like the shoulder rotation robot. I was going to say, I bet it's the robot. Yeah, because you get internal, external, while also being able to focus on scapular position and scapular um, stability. So I I really like that technique. So, and I would agree. I think it's a great exercise because it's not just the cuff um, being active and turned on. It's the cuff working with the scapular stabilizers that's important because when we lift our arm up, we have two thirds of the motion coming from the glenohumeral joint. And then the other third of the mobility is coming from scapulothoracic. So the muscles from your shoulder blade and your rotator cuff have to work in concert to keep that ball lined up on the saucer. Now, if you're having that this, as you approach this zone of instability, so say it's the abduction external rotation, what you want to do is just go outside of the area where you feel uncomfortable and turn on the muscle. So you might do the rotation robot, say you've you're actually for anterior instability, you're going to be in that position where you feel vulnerable. You might want to lower your elbows slightly um, so that you're not quite as vulnerable to instability to make sure that the rotator cuff is turned on and working with your scapular stabilizers and then raise your elbows and repeat the exercise so that the muscles are on and they're maintaining alignment. So it's, it's learning and training your muscles to be on in all positions. Another trick that you can use is kinesio tape. The skin will actually f- provide proprioceptive feedback. So by applying the um, kinesio tape to the skin around your shoulder, when you stretch your arm back, the skin starts to stretch 
and the feedback from the skin will also provide a neurologic feedback to the muscles around your shoulder. So you want to do the exercises slowly and in a controlled fashion so that you're always maintaining the joint centered and then you can increase the speed depending upon what activity you want to do. And I would suggest um, just if people don't have the actual Kinesio tape brand, uh, any tape, <laughs> some kind of tape, yes. uh, some kind of like, I like hockey. I always have hockey tape around because I play right. hockey and there's just rolls everywhere. Uh, I would use that. Um, but some kind of fabric tape would be good because mm -hmm. at least you get a little bit of a, a stretch. It's not so, it's not like um, masking tape or, or something like that. Duct tape would probably be okay, I'm guessing. Um, but something, just the, the principle that Dr. B is talking about getting that feedback from the skin stretching because you have something on there that's um, sticky, that's stuck to your skin is, is what you're going for. So use what you got if you don't have the, the exact tool that you have. All right, so that's shoulder subluxation. So dislocated shoulders for people who are, are not uh, familiar with subluxation as a, as a term. And we actually did a whole uh, session on shoulder subluxation YouTube live a few weeks ago. So um, I would encourage you to have a look mm -hmm. at that because um, there is a continuum of instability where stability means that the, you have normal anatomic alignment of the shoulder with motion. Subluxation is a partial dislocation and then a dislocation is complete loss of that normal anatomic alignment. So subluxation is partial loss of alignment. Dislocation is complete loss of alignment. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'll post that link to you in the chat to the previous session, just so, so you can find that. Okay, next up is Lisa W. Could you comment on problems of the sternoclavicular joint, e.g. swelling in one side of that joint and how to influence or help that? Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting problem, um, Lisa. What can happen is that muscles, primarily from the neck, you've got the sternocleidomastoid, You've got your pectoralis muscle from the, coming from the chest and some of the deeper neck muscles and the trap that are all inserting around the sternoclavicular joint. And uh, the key is to make sure that those muscles are not too tight and too short and pulling abnormally to pull the um, clavicle away from your breastbone. So they're kind of putting too much stress on the sternoclavicular joint, either not allowing it to move quite in the way that it should or actually pulling it slightly out of position. So my focus for people who have sternoclavicular joint issues is to do some active self myofascial release of all the muscles that surround the sternoclavicular joint. So that'd be the neck, the anterior chest, the upper uh, trap, upper shoulder area. Um, and then uh, focus a lot on correct posture so that if I turn sideways, uh, we define head forward posture is the jaw of your angle is sitting anterior or in front of the clavicle. So you want to be doing exercises to treat or prevent that head forward posture and engage the deep muscles around your neck. And Eric's got a really great series of exercises that you can um, use um, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, I'm not sure which, what you've got in mind, but uh, I've got a video on YouTube on levator scapulae, levator mm -hmm. scapula pain, which includes some active self myofascial release stuff. Um, and perhaps some of this stuff in shoulder control, I guess, is going to be relevant to release yeah. all the pecs and all the stuff around there. Yes. Um, lats, even all, the, yes. all that stuff. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. I had an S SC joint problem um, from getting hit from behind in hockey when I was, when was that? That was in university. I had to go to, I actually had to go to the Emerge for that one. It was pretty oh, serious. Wow. It was a, I think it was defined as a grade two sprain of my wow. SC joint, um, but it wasn't too bad. I mean, I was young. I just had a few beers and I was good after that. <laughs> so <laughs> recovered pretty quick, um, but it's still, I got a little bit of a bump and it's a little bit abnormal, abnormal looking, but it doesn't affect me anymore. Um, that's just random tangent. Okay. So let's, uh, continue. So Lisa, I, hopefully that is helpful. 
Um, Nikitesh, who's 30 years old. I have been having right front delt pain since many years, started to feel it when I was doing incline bench press. AC joint sprain is the diagnosis along with poor scapular muscles. I've been strengthening. Okay, so there's, <laughs> so there's no question here. Um, let me move on. Maybe I'll, I'll go back to that one if there's an actual question. Um, let's go to Francisco. My right shoulder is slightly dropped similar to the photo Dr. B showed in one of the slides. Uh, which program and how would you best rectify that? You might want to answer that one, Eric, as far as a scapular dyskinesia, what you would think, whether scapular control or shoulder control would be the better, yeah. uh, better program. Um, but I think you'd probably be better to answer that. Okay. Yeah. I think from that, I typically recommend shoulder control first, um, just because it's more comprehensive in the approach and then adding on scapular strength, typically later on in phase two, mm -hmm. once you're halfway through phase two, then you can start to really target in on the scapula. Um, but I think shoulder control has better activation, gets the, into the active self myofascial release stuff, uh, and it creates a better foundation to start with and then go into scap strength after that. So Francisco, hopefully that's, uh, that's helpful there. Richard, Richard Hernandez. I have a calcium deposit in my shoulder tendon, calcific tendonitis, and it hurts. Any ideas or info you can tell me? So I think we talked a little bit about calcific tendonitis in the last uh, session. And basically uh, when a calcium deposit, if, if my fingers are the thickness of the tendon, the calcium is usually in the middle of the tendon. So it's like the peanut butter in a sandwich. And it is a space occupying lesion. It can create thickening of the tendon itself. But in my opinion, most people run into problems with, um, with the calcium deposit because it affects how that muscle tendon unit is functioning. So usually you get a calcium deposit because there's some uh, abnormality in the blood supply. We call it dystrophic calcification. Uh, poor blood supply, and there's probably been some injury to the tendon. And when the body is trying to heal the, the injury, uh, calcium forms instead of a tendon. Now, the interesting thing with this whole disease, if we're going to call the calcium deposit or disease, is that the calcium can actually just sit there and lay dormant forever. Or there are times when we don't know what really causes this to happen, that the calcium deposit will burst into the shoulder bursa like a boil and cause a severe inflammatory response and uh, people can end up with a frozen shoulder. Now, it sounds to me like we're not in that phase. We're just in the phase where the calcium deposit is dormant and then there's some pain. Um, and so what I would be treating this as is um, really a rotator cuff tendinosis impingement type of program where you're focusing on making sure you've got good posture uh, and alignment of your neck and thoracic spine, good mobility of the thoracic spine, good position of your shoulder blade, activation of all the small cuff muscles and um, making sure that uh, you've got good range of motion. So I would progress through um, the shoulder control program, I think would be ideal for this. Um, if the calcium deposit bursts, then um, you have to try and decrease the inflammation. That's sort of the key, key issue that can be done through physio, but oftentimes a cortisone injection, this is one area where I'll say, wow, cortisone can really be beneficial because it's, it can be such a painful, painful problem. So I would get air on the side of getting the calcium to settle down the inflammatory response to the calcium crystals in your shoulder. And then you start a progressive program of reawakening your cuff and making sure that your shoulder mechanics are all intact. Cool. Okay, Richard, there you go. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, now, before we continue, I just wanted to mention something and I I'm gonna mention, maybe we'll talk about it after we get through the questions near the end, but I just wanted to mention that um, Dr. B is opening up space for a coaching program, which is basically like, how would you describe it? Almost like a second opinion, or it could be a first opinion if you don't have a, a first opinion, but mm -hmm. uh, basically guiding people through what you do here 
Yes. And taking in their history, evaluating them. Um, it includes some Zoom, Zoom time, one-on-one -on -one Zoom time, and then you'll create a program for them. Um, but I just wanted to mention that now in case anybody here is thinking, okay, this is good info, but I, I'd like a little more personalized approach, a little more guidance from Dr. B. Um, she's got some space now and I'll post the link after and we'll talk about it a little bit more after. But just wanted to give people a heads up that that is um, available. And if you want more info, we'll, we'll discuss it in a bit. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let's continue on. This is right up your, this one's going to be up your in your, Wheelhouse here, DS, thoughts on risk of diagnostic scope to evaluate shoulder, prior slap repair, revision, and subsequent bicep tendo tenodesis. Tenodesis. Yep. tenodesis. Okay, so um, I think a scope would be about the last thing that you need to do. Um, a lot of times, um, when say, so if you have a, a labral tear <clears throat> and problem with the long head of the biceps, you have to look at your shoulder and how you move and why you tore your labrum and injured the long head of biceps in the first place. That's the key thing. And one of the biggest issues that I've seen over my career, and I'm not being critical of surgeons because surgeons are trained to fix what's broken, but we need to really be asking why did it break and fix why it broke so that when the, the surgeon has done their job, we then fix the problem so that you don't re-break the labrum again or injure the biceps tendon. So I would be suspicious that you have issues with your thoracic spine mobility, with the position of your scapula, that you probably have a tight posterior capsule, uh, maybe a tight biceps muscle. Um, and I would want you to address all of those issues before you would entertain any kind of surgery. We know that your shoulder is going to be somewhat abnormal uh, because you've already had the surgery in the first place. So when you're thinking about, okay, we're going to look inside and we're going to see, oh, there's a labor repair and you will know, okay, did it heal or not heal? And there's a lot of controversy in the surgical literature about whether la slap tears actually ever heal. There's quite a bad blood supply there. We don't know if it's important for them to heal or not. And um, so I always think what information are we going to gain from looking inside your shoulder we already know it's going to be abnormal. And I think the answers really are going to be more on the outside. What's your thoracic spine doing? What's your alignment? How's your cuff functioning? What's your posterior capsule like? What's the position of your scapula? I would want to know all of that before I thought about any, yeah, even getting an MRI is going to be abnormal. So it's really looking at how you move. Right on. So this, again, folks, just before this question, I mentioned how Dr. B is opening up the, the consult or coaching service. This is the kind of thing that you don't get from typical most surgeons. Um, you're not going to get any advice on movement. You're just going to get, okay, this is what your images look like. And do you need surgery or not? That's the recommendation you'll get often. Um, and then after that, they'll just refer you out to perhaps a physio or some kind of uh, therapist. So I, this is why I think it's such a valuable service uh, for those who have these more I guess, not severe, maybe severe issues. I don't know how to, to label them as, but um, where there's a specific problem, specific damage that is occurring. Um, she can, she has all that experience from movement to surgery and she'll guide you to the best of her ability to get back to being active, trying to minimize your, or to decrease the uh, use of surgery as, as a tool, try to minimize that or make that the kind of last resort. So I think it's just such a valuable, valuable uh, perspective to get. It's really interesting, actually, uh, you know, over my career in baseball, um, not as a player, <laughs> but as a, as a surgeon with the Jays, um, when I first started working with them, and I, even it started well before this, uh, you know, really being at UCLA in a huge sports environment, uh, I did a fellowship there. And we were really keen to do surgery on everybody, especially the, when the arthroscopic procedures first came out. And part of this is learning curve, you know, as a surgeon, understanding what you can do and what you can't do. And it was interest, interesting for me to watch Dr. Jimmy Andrews, who's like probably one of the most um, experienced sports shoulder surgeons in baseball how at the beginning he used to operate on everybody and look at everything, you know, he, yep, gonna do a scope, gonna do a scope, gonna do a scope. 
And as is the end of his career, it's no, we're not going to do a scope. No, we're not going to, you don't need an operation and how his thinking about things changed. And even how the literature has really changed in orthopedics. It's um, I think doctors are starting to become more aware of the fact that we've got to understand the root problem and Yes, we may be able to help people's pain after they have an operation, but is that because they have been forced to not move for three months? They're in a, you know, they're in a sling, they're not moving, they're going for physio, they've modified their activities. And then I would find that a lot of people would be pretty good for their usual life, but when they tried to really ramp it up to play high level sport or do a, a um, it didn't have to be a high level sport, but let's say an activity that loaded the shoulder more aggressively, like hammering or serving a tennis ball, that people had to modify things still if they did not address that root cause of why their shoulder broke down. And that comes down to movement, in my opinion. It's all about how you move, how you load your, your body, and your body will break down if you overload it. But the beauty of the body is it can remodel, it can regenerate, and it can heal if you change how you're loading it. And you now if you wait too long, you know, and you, <clears throat> excuse me, and you've gotten significant arthritis or you've, you've left things for 10, 15 years, and there is significant damage to the joint, the goals become more, how do we prevent it from getting worse um, and, and still remain active? So, but the goal is always to keep moving. Yep. Yep. So regardless of how long it's been, um, whatever you have now, you can just keep it at least at the very least keep it. But typically most people, there's gonna be opportunities to improve regardless Vast of how majority. long. Vast yeah. majority for sure, Eric, you're right. Cool, okay. So let's move on to WH who's here. I'm gonna move on to some of the chat questions. We've been going through some of the previous questions, but let's, let's talk to some of the people who are here. So WLH, 31 years old, two questions, number one. I have bone spurs that seem to limit my ROM. Best practices on managing them, especially with regards to perhaps modifying workouts and preventing injuries. And maybe you can tell us kind of what kind of workouts and activities you get, get into. And then part two is what are ways to suss out if a workout is going to be effective and safe? There's all sorts of exercise and info out there. It's hard to tell if something's legit and not going to end up in injury. That's a good question. Is a good, <clears throat> excuse me, two good questions. Um, I do wonder whether the spurs are on the glenohumeral joint, that's the ball in the saucer, or whether it's more of a subacromial spur. Um, it's a little young to have arthritis in the shoulder like a glenohumeral, so I'm gonna assume that it's subacromial spur. And um, the, the spur is, a, it could be partly how your bones were shaped. Uh, we talked last week about type one, type two, type three acromion. Um, but the spurs can enlarge if you've got tissue pulling on that part of your bone and the bone responds to the stress of either a ligament or the muscle or tendon pulling on that part of the body um, by making more bone. So the key, what, sorry, what was the question about that? What, what um, sorry. Yeah, that was best practices on managing the bone spurs or dealing with them perhaps okay. modifying workouts. Okay, so the key here is to understand um, how you're potentially overloading that part of your shoulder. And usually in my experience, that means that, <clears throat> excuse me, that your cuff may not be functioning 100%, but more importantly, the shoulder blade, it may not be in quite the right position and, the, and your cervical thoracic alignment and mobility is interfering with your ability to put that shoulder blade in the right position and allow your cuff to function. So I would really be looking at all the things we've been talking about already quite a bit today. Good mobility of the thoracic spine, good cervical thoracic alignment, good position of your shoulder blade, and then activate your cuff uh, appropriately and progress into the exercises. Um, and how do you know? That's a really good question. You know, look, I've been around for a long time and um, you know, 30 years I've been in sports, I've met every strength and conditioning coach out there. And, you know, they're really some great people. And then there's some, there's some challenging exercise programs that are put out there. Um, and I guess this is where I want to toot Eric's horn. Um, I really think that Eric has, has done an amazing job and he's got good scientific principles that he's put behind 
all of his programs and he does things in a safe, progressive way so that you're not going to get hurt. One example is stretching versus active self myofascial release. So programs that have you doing a lot of stretching, um, you can, there, there is a time and place for stretching. Um, but in my experience, most of the time when you stretch the body, you're going to be lengthening tissues that really don't need to be lengthened. And the area that's maybe a little stuck and stiff um, is the tissue's not as pliable. So the body goes through the path of least resistance. So you stretch around the area that needs to actually be lengthened. So the active self myofascial release takes advantage of a principle of putting pressure on the body, moving around the pressure so that the tissues start to glide, but a signal is being sent to the body by the activation of the muscles, which creates length and allows tissues to relax and allows tissues to be pulled on safely. So um, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that by actively moving through the range, you own the range. When you just stretch passively and you gain 30 degrees of range, and then you go out and you move and you've got this extra range, if you don't have the muscular strength to control your body in that extra 30 degrees of movement, you could actually get injury. You could have a subluxation of your shoulder. You could, you could have a problem. So um, I really like how Eric has put that principle at the beginning of a program. And then he dissociates movements, which reprograms your neuromuscular system without even knowing what you're doing. <laughs> and it's beautiful the way it does, does it. And I really like that because a lot of times you're given a sheet of paper and you're told to do an exercise and you've been moving using the wrong movement pattern for a while. And that's why you're injured. And oftentimes it's hard to break that pattern. So unless you actively do something to change how you're using your muscles, you'll just fall into the old pattern and you either might have more pain after the exercise because you're using the muscles and stressing the tissue in the body in the way that has created the injury in the first place with the good intention of trying to activate the right muscle. Um, so it's really complicated. And I think my answer to the second question would be know your source. Um, there's a lot of good people out there that give really good exercises, but you need to know them. You need to know your source. And I know Eric and I, I've sought to work with Eric because of the confidence that I have that he can achieve what I need the patient to achieve. If I say, please go and do this exercise. So. Awesome. Thanks Dr. B. Appreciate the, the kind words there. And, um, I'll follow up with um, talking about a little bit about the strength conditioning stuff out there that you're going to see a ton of strength and conditioning, whether it's get stronger, build muscle, lose fat, uh, a lot of workouts in the fitness world, Instagram, wherever you are, you're going to see this stuff coming up. And there's a couple of things. Um, one is whenever you're starting a new program, always start low and progress up. So if a program is asking for four sets, then you just have to take this principle and say, I'm gonna start with one set or two sets. When I'm creating program, I just created a program for a, a guy who's gonna be competing in the um, Abu Dhabi Combat Challenge in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's a, he's a BJJ guy. So I'm, I'm working with him and he hasn't been working out much other than doing some Jiu Jitsu just recently but gyms have been closed. So I started him off. He's a fit, strong guy generally. He still kept active through the, the lockdown, but I started him off with two sets of exercises for the first week. He's gonna do three workouts in terms of strength and conditioning, like in terms of resistance training, he's gonna do three workouts, they're all two sets. And he, sometimes I'll get notes back, hey, this is easy. Like, good, it should be easy because we're just getting your body used to these movements. Next week is not gonna be as easy. And then a couple of weeks down the road, you're gonna be, crying about how much <laughs> volume and intensity you're doing, but we're ramping you up slowly because I would rather err on the side of too little at the beginning than too much because too much um, in, you know, the best case scenario, you're going to get sore and that's going to delay uh, a workout. You're not going to be able to do your schedule work on Thursday. You might have to do it on Saturday. 
in the worst case scenario, you're going to pull something, you're going to strain a muscle, you're going to hurt a joint, something, you're going to create some kind of injury. And then that's going to have you out for weeks of recovery. So it's, yeah, there's all these different factors to weigh to weigh out, but the one principle is progression. So start air on the side of lower volume, lower intensity, work on your movement, pay real close attention to your form and then ramp it up over time. Um, and then the second point that I'll make about the workouts is that this is especially in the, the fitness fat loss, that side of things is they're going to crush you with, volume, intensity, tons of extra, like 15 exercises in a circuit, um, all these crazy things you'll see. What I'll say about those things is any movements, if you're inactive or you're coming to this type of, coming to exercise and working out uh, from an inactive or sedentary state, then avoid movements where you're jumping, velocity, high velocity, high speed movements. You know, you wanna start with slower controlled movements and then you want to work towards velocity, power, and speed. Um, exercises that to look out for that are super popular are burpees, uh, jumping squats, jumping lunges, uh, explosive push-ups. Um, I had Jeff Jawson, so Je our friend Jeff, BJJ MMA fighter, super great guy. He was doing a program that recommended push-ups on the backs of your hands. Oh boy! Uh, he got obviously you got wrist pain after that. Um, and this is in an initial stage, but so the thing to keep out, keep a, an eye on for sure is that you can see clearly is velocity, high speed, high velocity, jumping type movements, ballistic, plyometric type movements. Any of that stuff has got to come after a, you've built a, a strong foundation of strength and control and mobility. Because if you don't, the chances of an injury are very, very high, especially if you're coming to it from an inactive or sedentary state. So those are just two comments on the strength and conditioning side of things that people can get into, um, especially around new year's, but, uh, as gyms are opening up now, you're, you're going to get into that now. And if you haven't been active, then ramp it up slowly and start with slower controlled movements. Eric, I think that's great advice. And I, you know, I, I know that both of us are real proponents of movement longevity mm -hmm. and what's the hurry. If we're hoping to be moving till we're a hundred years old, we don't have to get all of our fitness within two weeks. Slow and steady, give your tissues time to adapt, give your body time to adjust, make sure everything feels okay. And you're gonna build on that foundation over time. And, and to me, that's so important in preventing injury, having good performance and being able to move forever. And I plan, I mean, I wanna be out on the tennis court when I'm like a hundred. So, you know, I gotta be, yeah. I got to be careful. I got to be smart. And, yeah. and every exercise should have a purpose. We don't just do something because we need to do something and burn a few calories. It's actually, there should be purpose, full movement. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'll be right, right out there with you on the courts. <laughs> Good. You really will be kicking my butt at that time. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. You're taking it easy on me. <laughs> okay. So next up we have Liza Kent. Got a couple questions here. Um, number one, doing the sleeper stretch and okay. Doing the sleeper stretch, where should we feel the stretch? I feel it in my upper arm, but not my shoulder or back. So let's go one by one. She's got, she's got three questions here and she's here. So, um, okay. so sleeper stretch comments on that generally. And then sometimes some um, people will get pain kind of in the upper arm area. And, and that is not the goal. Um, what I would suggest that you do is that you adjust your position slightly. You should be feeling the stretch and it should be a stretching uh, feeling at the back of the shoulder here, kind of where your, your sleeve and your armpit, you know, in the air of the armpit, just behind that, that's where you want to feel this. You, so I would adjust your arm so that it's either a little lower or a little higher. And you can also roll your body over onto your arm a little bit more or a little less so that you're not feeling that pinching kind of pain in the deltoid region. So make some adjustments, do your motion, and then try to work so that you can have your arm up at 90 degrees and um, be right up on top of your shoulder. But if you're not feeling the stretch at the back, then you're not achieving the purpose of the stretch. And you might be just impinging your cuff 
So I wouldn't recommend that. Mm -hmm. And I posted a, a link to the active sleeper stretch that we have on, on YouTube, which I learned from Dr. B. Um, and, but I just put the video up after I learned that. But uh, that's what we'd recommend if you're not doing that version, if you're doing the traditional passive version. Um, I have just found in working with a lot of uh, athletes, specifically combat athletes, this was a common stretch to be recommended to, to guys. And then they'd come to me and um, I would watch them doing it and they, they'd be telling me about shoulder problems, some kind of shoulder problem, which is very common in, in especially boxing. But they would show me, okay, I've been doing this. I've been stretching. Okay, show me your stretch. They'd show me the, the sleeper stretch because they want to stretch out their rotator cuff for some reason. And then they show me and they're doing it and they're just reefing on their arm mm -hmm. because you can do that with that stretch. You can really reef on it easily. It doesn't take much pressure to, to put a lot of force through that uh, muscle. And it just... I think it causes more damage than it, it's going to cure when you're doing it passively, just like Dr. B talked about, you're not owning the range. You're not gaining strength there. Uh, the rotator cuff has to be strong and it has to be smart. If you just stretch it, you're making it weaker and dumber essentially, because you're, you're taking away some of that good proprioception that you get from um, when it's active. Cause when you stretch a muscle statically, you're toning down the neuromuscular, uh, What's the term I'm looking for? The neuromuscular feedback. feedback. Yes, you're toning that down. That's what static stretching does. That's why if you have an overactive muscle that won't shut off and you're trying to get other muscles on, but that overactive muscle, for example, pec minor can often be very overactive and it's hard to activate other muscles like serratus anterior because the pec minor is taking all that, uh, doing all that work. That's when a static stretch can be very useful. You stretch the heck out of it, shut it off, tell it to shut up and go away. And then you go do, do your serratus anterior activation exercises. But for the sleeper stretch, you're targeting the rotator cuff. Those are muscles that you want on. You want them on more than you want them off. So static stretching, I, that's one I never recommend the, the sleeper too much. It's very rare that I'll recommend it. And if I do, it's very specific in when it comes and what follows it afterwards. If I do do it, I'll follow it up with an activation exercise for the rotator cuff. Um, but that's a little rant on the sleeper because I've, I've seen a lot of problems uh, come about because of overly aggressive doing that thing. And it, well, we've got that. We've got the little video that you've done that I think is really yeah. good on how to do what we would say is like an active sleeper stretch. So, yep. yep, I've posted that down so you can check that out if you if you haven't seen that one. Um, so, okay. So this is, this will be an interesting one. I'd like to get your take on this. I want, this is from Liza again. I wonder what you think about practicing the headstand in yoga. Is it harmful to the neck and shoulder? Hmm. Good question. Well, I think if you do it technically correctly with good alignment and using the correct muscles, it's not a problem, but a lot of us don't have good alignment. <laughs> it's really, it's tough these days, gosh, with, you know, computers and driving and, just positions, it's, it's hard to have that good alignment. So I don't know if it, I, I always ask, you know, what is the goal of, or the purpose of the exercise? And is there something that maybe you could substitute that maybe wouldn't put that same stress on your neck and your shoulder? But if you've got perfect alignment and you love this exercise and it feels good for you, I wouldn't say no, but um, yeah. That's kind of my two cents on that one, Liza. Yeah, if, if it's opening up your chakras nicely, then, uh, then yes. go for it. Yes. <laughs> but as long as you're, if you're doing that thing with forward head, um, goodbye cervical mm. intervertebral discs. Yeah. Like those things are gonna get smashed, facet joints are gonna get smushed in there. It would be nasty. So if you have any like beginnings of forward head um, that you, where you can't keep that good neutral alignment and neutral is not flat. It is keeping the natural curve, but keeping the, the muscles active to maintain that curve. Um, then I, I just, I, I wouldn't do that S sitting on your head. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, just a, a side note. I was actually practicing doing handstands with my kids just for fun. Um, we have in my daughter's bedroom, we have lines set up away from the wall. So the closer you get, then you're more like a vertical position. Um, but I, I actually tweaked my neck. It was a couple of weeks ago. I tweaked my neck just because I was holding the handstand 
And I just looked up because I did, I was about to exit and I wanted to make sure I didn't crush a kid on my way out. So I looked up and I just tweaked something in, in my neck. Um, and it, it took about three days for it to go away. Um, but during that process, what I was doing, just for a little bit of insight, um, I was doing isometrics. So I was making sure my neck was in neutral and there was no, I knew it wasn't like a broken <laughs> joint, broken bone, a vertebrae wasn't fractured or anything like that. So all I was doing was simple isometrics where I just make sure I'm in really good neutral, chin tucked, nice and tall, and then pushing on all sides of my head, different directions, rotation, but isometric. Um, because what I wanted to do when there's a joint injury, what I want to do is tell my brain, okay, my muscles are still working. So if there's any you know, pain that you can stop me from experiencing, because I'm not going to, I promise I'm not going to do anything stupid again. Um, please do that for me. That's what I'm trying to tell my brain. So just light isometrics, not intense, just to show, tell my brain that my muscles are on, I'm stable. Um, and please, you know, decrease, downregulate that pain a little bit. So just a little tangent there. I think that's excellent. And anybody who has a, a whiplash injury, like a you know, a minor whiplash injury, that is excellent, an excellent thing to do because when the muscles are turned on, the body feels better. This is what I used to do right after surgery is I would get people turning on their muscles around the joint that I operated on in a safe way. I, you know, I'd know what I could turn on and what I couldn't turn on, but I would have yeah. people do isometrics because it definitely decreases pain, decreases swelling. And if you have decreased pain and swelling, then your range comes quickly. And it's amazing how that trick works, at Eric. So you know that intuitively. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So Liza, final question here. You're getting, what do we have? A tennis question. What do you recommend for increasing ROM in a tight shoulder? My serving shoulder is much tighter than my left, which is very common. Uh, my hands don't touch if I reach behind my back and over my shoulder. Well, I would be saying you should go and do the, the little uh, assessment uh, on the ROM coach and get some exercises there. Eric's got a group of really good exercises uh, that will tackle that issue for sure. And, and you know, you're right. It's very common in tennis players. And I believe that, um, you know, we wanna be active and we wanna go and do activities. And what happens is when we're active, we create imbalances. So I really encourage people to take uh, ownership of that and do the exercise to prevent the imbalance or correct the imbalance and you'll find two things. One, you won't get as injured. And two, you'll perform better. Your serve will be better. So um, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. And we actually have in the, in the app, the assessment inc includes that behind the back, mm -hmm. hands behind the back test. So you'll fail that because you can't touch and you'll get recommended the, the routine to, to deal with that. I think that's the total shoulder mobility one routine which yep. I'm actually doing right now. I'm going through it. Um, and I love that routine. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, do that up and that'll, that'll be a good place to start. And if you want to go deeper, I would recommend shoulder control because mm -hmm. you're, you're going to learn a lot more about your, your body and your shoulder. By doing that, you'll be introduced to more exercises, some more in depth and comprehensive um, and progressive. So check that out as well, Liza. Okay, next up, we have Ross, 27 years old. Last week, after some stretching and mobility for poor external rotation in left shoulder, I had intense acute pain in anterior delt, inhibiting all movement. Four days later, however, pain all but gone and ROM normal. Um, did I likely pull or tear the muscle or possibly another issue? And any cues for when doing exercises for poor external rotation? Okay, uh, well, there's a number of possibilities. Um, most likely, particularly how quickly you've recovered, which is good news. Um, you, you might have slightly subluxed the joint. It depends a little bit on how much um, abduction you had in addition to the external rotation. But if your elbow was tucked in at your side and you were in the scapular plane, it's not likely you subluxed. Uh, but if your elbow was up higher, it's possible. Uh, or you could have just um, pulled like at a molecular level, you know, some of the collagen fibers in, in one of the tenders, tendons at the front of the cuff. And, um, or, or you may not have even torn anything, but you just got to that point where you were going to pull something and your body creates this pain signal because pain 
it is really, it's a warning system. It's a good thing. It's telling you don't go any further or you're going to completely blow this tendon or you're going to completely dislocate this shoulder. So it's a, it's a signal that's good to prevent you from doing something terrible. Um, so I don't think you've done anything horrific because your range of motion has come back so quickly and the pain has settled, but I think it's very important that you um, make sure that all of your rotator cuff muscles are turned on now. And um, Eric, I'm going to let you suggest what exercises you like the best for the external rotation. External rotation. Um, what do I have? I'm trying to think what I have available. I think the one that I have is inside the shoulder control course. Um, where it's, again, it's basically an active end range technique. It's an ERE end range expansion technique for external rotation. Um, that one is going to really target gaining external rotation range of motion. Um, but the shoulder rotation robot, and I'll post that because that's on YouTube as well. That's good for, for working that range as well. And you're going to work it in a safe fashion. So it's, it's a, a great technique. It's like I said, it's one of my favorite techniques for the shoulders to, to activate um, and it's very safe. So you really can't go wrong with that one. And I like the robot because you've really got to work on your scapular stabilizers. And I yeah. believe that if your scapular stabilizers are weak, you're not going to have good external rotation. Um, I know from personal experience, this is crazy. Okay. So like I'm a shoulder surgeon, so I would say, okay, what's your external rotation? And I would, you know, tuck in and I would try to demonstrate to the patient, what's your external rotation? And I don't know, at one point I could only like externally rotate about 10 degrees. I'm like, what's going on here? And I think it's because I was so weak in my back muscles that I wasn't able to really engage and hold my scapula in the right position and then get my infraspinatus uh, working properly. So uh, I like the robot because it will get the scapular stabilizers working as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a really good point because um, even with people who, if you have protracted scapula, just mm -hmm. from a postural perspective, if your scapula are protracted and you try to do external rotation, you're not going to be able to go as far just because of the position of your scapula that they're starting in. So the ability to be able to retract the scapula will open up that range. So I don't know if, let me see if it's, it's a bit tight in here. Um, but if I'm protracted scapula, you can see kind of where my fist ends up, ah, it kind of sucks, but whatever, you can get the idea. But then if I retract my scapula, you can see that angle quite open up quite a bit, right? So if you have scapula that are just protracted posturally, that's going to limit your, your external rotation, uh, as well. So I think there's some, some points to work on there for you. Okay, so that was Ross. Um, next up is Steven Heber. Started ROM and having difficulty in the, oh, so the app started ROM coach and having difficulty in the 90-90 position with right knee back. Wondering if it can be modified or different prescribed activity to hips and balance. Program is a real blessing. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll take this one because that's specific Perfect. to the 90-90 the position. Um, you know what, this is something that I've heard from a few people, quite a few people, the 90-90 position being problematic and difficult to get into. So I am going to do something about that. Um, provide, I was thinking about even doing just a 90-90 specific routine inside the app for that as like a foundation. If you have problems with any of these types of exercises, go back and do this routine first. Um, some things that you can think about there is you can lean over onto your elbow if you're really having trouble and just do the exercises from that position. Because by doing that, you're gonna be increasing, what's limiting you there is the internal rotation of your hip. So by doing exercises in the position, but leaning on your elbow so that you're not as deep in the internal rotation, you're gonna be still working that internal rotation. And by being able to work it, you're gonna be able to get deeper over time. So that in and of itself might help. Uh, so that's what I would recommend to start. Otherwise I would say uh, the, look out for some content to be coming inside the app to address this specific thing because I've heard it from a number of people. Okay, so that's Steven. Uh, Martine Beland, I had a stroke 25 years ago 
Now I have difficulties raising my right arm up to 135 degrees in abduction, 150 degrees in flexion. Any ideas or exercises? So I'm wondering if you, it's the aside, I'm assuming that you were affected by the stroke and if you're hypertonic, if your muscles are really turned on, um, it can be a challenge because there, is, there can be a problem post-stroke where your uh, muscle tone is increased and um, it's not like you're fighting yourself all the time. Um, I think that the water can be very beneficial. Um, moving in the water and um, I would um, also work on the end range expansion techniques that Eric teaches because you turn on a muscle which is also turning off another. So if you have a muscle that's too high in its tone, you want to be turning on the opposite muscle so that you can create the reflex for that muscle to relax. The problem with the shoulder, it can be kind of a global thing with the stroke. It's not like it's just one muscle. It's the, it's the whole shoulder girdle that can be affected. So then what I would do is sort of a sequential turn it on, turn it off um, to try and gain the motion, the motion actively. And then um, if you can get in a pool, the water will take the weight of your arm, depending on how weak you are. That can also help to allow you to activate your muscles without um, too much weight from your arm specifically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with dealing with stroke, post-stroke rehab. Um, so I, if there isn't any residual, I guess, problems from the stroke, then I, I would echo the, the working on the ERE techniques and range expansion techniques and see if that's helpful. Um, I'm just thinking about something that you've told me, Dr. B, is, you know, getting to the end range and then doing some of the rhythmic stabilization stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that can help to wake up uh, muscles a little bit more. So um, what can I show? Maybe I could show, let me see if I could pull up this technique, the lasso technique. The lasso, I was thinking. You were thinking that? Okay. So let me see if I could pull this up. Just a moment, peeps. Because uh, one time, one thing that can happen with the stroke, if you have increased tone is that the muscles are just always like this, you know, they're on. So you want to get them to try to relax, contract relax, contract, relax, contract. And um, they tend to always just be contracted and everything wants to turn on when you want to move. So it, it's kind of a coordination thing, but it's, it's a very big challenge because it's coming from the brain itself, not so much from the muscles perifer peripherally. So it is a challenge. Um, and I think that you, you have to follow the principles that Eric was talking about earlier, where you're going to go slowly with things, try out a couple of movements to see what effect that may have. And if you feel positive with it, then you build on that. Uh, but don't go crazy and do like 10 hours of the lasso in one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I found it here. Let me um, share my screen and let's see if I play that. This is the lasso. So you could do this in any range of motion. Um, of the shoulder. Right now, I'm just in neutral. My arm is by my side, so my shoulder is in neutral. But basically, grab something on a string and whip it around. And if you can imagine, muscles are turning off and on, off and off, cyclical, uh, what the muscles will go through, going in different directions. So you could do this with the arm up a little bit, different positions. You could do it up here. You could do, I mean, you could be side lying and doing it. Uh, so there's all different variations that you could do, but the principle is basically just to uh, get the rhythmic motion off and on, off and on, a little bit reactive uh, that will help to wake up muscles and help the muscles learn how to cycle on and off. And if you, if you find that the weight of your arm is too much uh, as you're trying to lift it, then you could try this in the pool where you would actually just take your arm in the pool and you would just move the water up and down, up and down, up and down very gently. You're not trying to swim per se, and you're not, um, but you can, the buoyancy of the water will take the weight of your arm so that you aren't having to fight and lift your arm and do this kind of rhythmic movement. So you kind of have, we're not sure where you are in your 
rehab or where, you know, what your muscles are doing, but you could try it in the pool and then progress to the lasso if the lasso is too hard for you to hold and move, move around. But you can also, I guess you could have your arm bent a little bit so that the lever arm is shorter and make sure that it's something very light that you're dealing with, you know, tennis ball and a sock <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, or anything, yeah. you know, that you can whip around. Yeah. Yeah. That one, what I had there was just a skipping rope. Skipping rope. Yeah. yeah perfect. So, so light. Very, very light. Very light. Yeah. You don't want to be whipping around a 10 pound medicine ball um, <laughs> with this one. Okay. So Martin, some ideas that can hopefully help you out there. Um, now we've got a couple of questions on sleep, sleeping issues. So mm -hmm. one is, let's go one at a time. They're a little different. Uh, Bradford's 35. I've had increasing pain in both shoulders from side sleeping in various positions. Um, what do you recommend or what do you think? You know, it depends a little bit on what the primary problem is, but shoulders can be really horrible at night. Um, if you have a reclining chair, um, sleeping in a reclining chair on your back, put a couple of pillows under your knees, a couple of pillows under your arms, that can be, that can be very beneficial. Um, if you don't have a reclining chair, uh, you, could, um, you can buy, there are these like pillows that you can prop up um, on your bed so that you can kind of help and sleep in a slight semi upright position. I don't know if it, I think it's the distraction of the arm and the gravity that kind of opens the shoulder a little bit that, that helps it feel better. Um, we've talked about this a little before and Eric had a really good point, making sure you've got a good mattress, I think is key with any kind of sleep. Um, really, really important. Um, those are the, the recliner I find is, probably one of the most beneficial positions to be in. Oftentimes I would have people sleep in the recliner post-surgery just for a week or two. And then once things settle down and you get your cuff turned on, then often the pain settles down. So um, during the day, make sure you're turning your cuff on and um, take the position that we've just dis discussed um, at night. Mm -hmm. Do you know why that would occur? Why do the, the shoulders have more problems at night if there's an issue there? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's a couple of things. I think that our mind is often busier during the day so that we're distracted and we're thinking of other things. And, you know, when we keep moving and we're always using them, it's kind of like they're greased up and they're, you know, not, they're, they're, they're uh, the tissues are a little bit more pliable and warm. But then at night when you stop moving and they get into one position, and then particularly if you lie on it and you put, you know, put pressure on it, um, then the tissues can kind of contract a bit. They're less pliable. Um, maybe some inflammation is occurring in reaction to the activities that you did during the day. Um, and our mind is not distracted with other things. So it comes into the forefront. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right. So let's move to Jan's question. This is like the opposite pretty much. I experience minimal pain during the day in my shoulder, but as soon as I lay down, my problem can go into overdrive. She suspects an impingement issue, uh, but she's a back sleeper, rarely on her shoulders. Tried all the pillow advice under the, uh, under the arm, no pillow under the head or small one, nothing works. The most comfortable I can get is if I raise the arm and rest it by the side of my head. That helps the longest until I have to try something else. Hmm. So what do you think about that one? Well, I think that what's happening is when Jan's putting her arm up over her head, she's actually getting the tuberosity out from under the coracochromial arch. So it's not being impinged. So that is a position that can, can be pain, less painful. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I, I'm a little surprised that with some distraction in a reclining chair position, that it's not helpful. Um, but it could just be the phase of the, um, the, the problem. And I would be curious about a frozen shoulder. Oftentimes when people are just at the beginning of developing a frozen shoulder, that the, they have these kind of symptoms, which are just unrelenting at night and it can be horrible. Um, you might try an ice pack at night um, for a short period of time on your shoulder. That might help before you try to go to sleep. Um, and, and, and then contrast it with heat. And the other thing that you can do is actually, if it's a frozen shoulder, put it right into the axilla 
So you can go hot and cold. You can get one of those bean bags. So you can have one bean bag cold and one bean bag you can warm up in the microwave and then do alternate hot and cold um, so that that can try to give you some relief of pain and you can get to sleep. But I feel for you, it's a challenge. Um, and try to activate your cuff gently, just some gentle isometrics to turn it on. We're not talking about moving and doing exercise in the middle of the night, but just a pushing and holding to turn the cuff on can maybe help break the pain cycle a little bit. Mm. So that's some good advice there. Um, so Jan, hopefully you've you identified impingement with some online tests. I don't know if they're the ones from the YouTube video that I have, but uh, hopefully you're doing some some of the impingement exercises because mm -hmm. that'll that'll be necessary if it is an impingement problem to uh, decrease the pain and the the repetitive kind of irritation that'll happen if you don't deal with the root cause of that. Um, that'll keep that around. So. Hopefully that, uh, that's helpful. Um, a lot of times when people get in so much pain, they kind of stop doing everything and then everything shuts off and the shoulder is so reliant on the cuff and the scapular muscles to function properly. So it becomes a vicious circle of pain, cuff even sleepier, scapular stabilizers not working and compensating, more pain, you do less, more pain, you get stiffer you know, and it becomes a really vicious circle. So I really encourage people when they're in, in a lot of pain with their shoulder, there's a pendular exercise that can be also beneficial. You can get up and just get up carefully. You can place your hand on, it depends how high your bed is, but say like a, a desk level, you can put your um, forehead, rest your forehead on your hand and bend over on the good side. And then you just let gravity pull your shoulder down to the ground and you can just do a very gentle pendular circle. And that often will get a little bit of movement into the tissues and it relax, you relax everything. Um, that can help to, to decrease your pain. Uh, so that's another thing to do when you've got an exquisitely painful shoulder. You're not actively trying to lift in that situation. You're just passively letting gravity distract the joint. And then you turn on your cuff with an isometric. Nice, okay. Okay, Jan, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, next up, we have David, who's 62. Subacromial impingement came on for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> no reason, just appeared. Um, MRI, ultrasound, subacromial space is seven millimeters, i.e. no overhead activities. Managing it through passive hanging. This is another one of those hanging mm -hmm. questions from the same. He cited the source, so it's the same source that we talked about last mm -hmm. time. Uh, sleeper stretch, et cetera. Any idea why this happened and how it can be prevented in the future? So um, I like that Eric's laughing when you said it just happened for no reason, because what it does is it sneaks up on us. And there are reasons that have to do with um, how we move over time and just living life. And if we're, you know, one hand dominant, if you're right handed, uh, you're going to have differences between your right hand and your left hand uh, and left shoulder because of how we use our shoulders and our body. So what tends to happen and what I see happen over time is that people develop head forward carriage, their thoracic spine becomes less mobile. This affects the position of the shoulder blade. The shoulder blade can be rounded, protracted. That decreases the subacromial space dynamically. So even you can measure the subacromial space on an X-ray or an MRI, but you can lessen that even further by uh, the position of your shoulder blade when you're using your arm. And then you pinch the cuff, the cuff goes to sleep. Then when the cuff is asleep, it's not doing its job of keeping the ball centered on the saucer. You lift your arm up, you pinch the cuff, and it becomes a vicious circle where you start getting tendon changes, tendinosis, impingement, pain. Um, the posterior capsule often is tight. And um, so it's this series of unfortunate events that occur just by living life. And unless you do something to rebalance your body and make sure you've got good alignment, then it can sneak up on you. And, and it's the weirdest thing. You can just wake up one day and have it. So you just feel like nothing happened and boom, you've got this problem where you reach into the cupboard and you take out a plate. Oh, something happens to your shoulder, the dog pulls on your leash. You know, there's just these little things that can happen. You reach into the back seat to get your briefcase and then all of a sudden your shoulder's sore. But that's kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. 
So what you need to do is to go and deal with all the alignment uh, of your spine, your shoulder, balance of the soft tissues, and make sure you're using the correct muscles. And uh, we've talked a little bit about the sleeper stretch already. Um, Eric and I are both proponents of the active sleeper stretch uh, to release the posterior capsular tissue. Um, and you have to do that in combination with activating your rotator cuff and um, scapular stabilizers. So it's a bit complicated, but if you follow along with um, the shoulder control course, uh, Eric takes you step by step and can help you prevent this from coming back again by addressing these movement issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to, to realize that it's not coming out of nowhere. It's, but it's not like there was an acute injury. It was, uh, cool. <laughs> that's okay. Dogs are having a party. Um, yeah, it's, it's came from somewhere and that somewhere is likely um, the way that you move. And what you need to do is educate yourself on how it is you need to move to achieve movement longevity, to deal with the pain and to achieve movement longevity. Um, so shoulder control, I think is, is the best, the best for that because you'll be taken step through step by step through from anatomy and movement terminology. This is, these are all the ways that your shoulder does move. This is your scapula, this is scapulohumeral rhythm, all that stuff. Um, you learn about it and then you'll also apply it. So you'll have exercises to train different things and you'll learn as you're applying. So I think that's really important. And I, I think the biggest problem I see, Eric, sorry to interrupt, but with um, people that they rest and they feel good, but they haven't addressed the movement problem. So then, you know, they take six weeks off from their activity. Their shoulder starts to feel pretty good. They start to go back out to their sport or, you know, gardening, whatever it is that they want to do. And they're okay at the beginning, but as soon as they start to ramp up the intensity or they ramp up the frequency of they're doing their activity, the problem comes back again. And this is because they haven't addressed the primary movement issue. So it's really important so that you, you don't go through this cycle because it can be, you know, you have the problem once and then you rest and then you kind of compensate and feel fine for two months, six months, a year, and then it comes back, but then it's harder to get rid of the next time, lasts a little longer. Um, so it, and it progresses slowly over time. So now would be an excellent opportunity for you to address your issues before they really um, take a hold of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got a question from Matt. He's 39 years old here. And he's saying he's got ongoing rotator cuff issues, had surgery on the right years ago, which has worked well. Left is now the problem. Uh, is plasma injections a valid option to post surgery? And for tendinopathy, are eccentric exercises the best treatment? Okay, Matt, well, you've got some good questions here. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is you got to fix your primary movement problem. So for both of your shoulders, it would be dealing with um, all the things we've already mentioned today. Um, so that would be number one. Um, and then a plasma injection um, can be beneficial if you've got a partial tear, for example. It, say you've done, you've corrected all your movement issues um, but you've got a very high demand activity that you want to do that is not, um, it's not allowing you to, to, uh, or sorry, it's the, the demand, the activity demands so much of that tissue that you still have pain. So um, it doesn't sound like you're in that situation because you only have tendinosis. So I know that the rotator cuff is actually intact. Um, so I think that for you, I would say change how you move first and you've, probably got a 95% chance of being fine without needing any, anything else. No surgery, no plasma injection, no nothing. Um, so that would be my answer. If you were, if you were somebody who had like a, an 80% tear of the rotator cuff tendon and you were doing a high demand activity, then I think a PRP injection, a plasma, a, a platelet rich plasma injection could help to promote healing of the tendon to avoid surgery, but your choice at that point would be, do I want to operate on my activity? Do I not want to try to be a professional pitcher? For example, like we're talking that kind of force, throwing a hundred mile an hour fastballs or serving tennis for serves in tennis, uh, bricklayer. 
someone, a painter or someone who's doing really repetitive overhead activity that's pretty intense all the time, uh, they may not be able to function even if they've got everything perfectly lined up now because of the, dish, uh, the damage to the tissue. That's when I think a PRP injection could be considered. It will, pro it will provide growth factors to promote healing of the tendon. And there's a scaffold there for the, from the partial tear to allow the tendon to potentially heal and recover to a point where you wouldn't need surgery. Okay, and then eccentric exercises for tendinopathy. And this is a very common recommendation. There's a lot of research behind eccentric exercises. Um, what are your thoughts on eccentrics for tendinopathies? Well, I think that the scientific principle is that you're lengthening and strengthening the tissue, you know, that you're gaining strength as you lengthen. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of work, I think, that has shown some, some benefit and some effect. But I think that the key really is that the muscle is being turned on and strengthened through the range of motion appropriately. And whether that's done through a concentric, isometric, or eccentric fashion, um, it's a little bit of a moot point. But um, if you, and particularly if you have balance around the joint, you probably don't have to focus so much on the eccentric component of it. Most tendons and muscles that are incredibly short and tight are that way because they're being overloaded because something else isn't working properly. So if you turn on what's not working properly so that the guy that's short and tight can relax, then the tendinosis resolves. So I'm more of a proponent of getting proper alignment, getting proper balance of the muscles and the soft tissues and making sure that you've got the correct muscles working and that all of them are working so that you can allow the tissue and the muscle that's being overloaded and worn out to heal and relax because now you've got the whole, you've got the whole party working together. You've got 10 guys doing the job instead of just the one guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you I'm, think? Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you that um, <laughs> because I, I do have thoughts on that and I, I basically think the same thing. Um, so just a, a point outside of that is research, the world of research. And is that saw really loud? There's somebody sawing. It's, it's, That's it. Oh, it Hopefully, just stopped. Man. Okay. Well, you know what? It's going to, I'm going to close the door. I'm going to boil in here, but it's, oh, it's okay. This is worth it. Um, research. So in research, their goal, the researcher's goal is to isolate a variable because it's really hard to do a study with a bunch of different variables. So They've, at some point, somebody decided, I think, to, to study eccentric exercises based on a hypothesis of perhaps lengthening of the muscle or because they create greater amount of force um, or you can handle greater amounts of force doing an eccentric versus a concentric or isometric. I don't know the reason why this first started, but they're basically, I'm going to isolate this variable and, and this way I can study and see if there's an effect. And they found that there was a positive effect to strengthening the muscle through eccentrics, but they're not comparing it up against the whole breadth of things that you could do. You could do, you know, all the things that we're talking about. If you incorporate active self myofascial release, incorporate dissociation techniques. If you do that in a progressive way and ramp it up over time, um, they're not going to study that stuff. One, because they don't know those techniques because they're pretty novel. Um, not everybody knows this stuff, but Two, it's really hard to do a study when you have all these different variables floating around and you're not sure. Um, then, then you have to think about uh, compliance uh, with the program and all these other things. So the research world, the stuff that you get there, you have to put it into context of, okay, what is available to me to do? What is this saying? And how does this fit into the big picture of you know, all the things that I could do? Um, so that's where I think that when you rely on, you know, the expertise of people that sources that you trust and that provide explanations for why they're doing things and scientific reasoning behind their recommendations, um, then, then you can kind of see how that works together. Um, now, that was just kind of a rant on the research because, you know, going into reductionism and just trying to isolate, same thing with supplements this is where it gets really, really crazy because they're gonna isolate this little chemical and say, oh, okay, this little chemical taken in this dose over time influences this other chemical, which is related to perhaps this thing, this end result 
that could be beneficial. <coughs> um, but <laughs> that didn't work by taking a, a earphones for the cough. <laughs> it was still a loud cough, which is sorry. Okay. <laughs> I didn't but, get the microphone far away. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I don't have COVID, I swear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's good. I saw her. She's good. Um, but yeah, the supplement world, you're taking this little chemical out of what may have come from a food that has all of these other chemicals and phytonutrients and, and different proportions in it, fiber and carbs and whatever it is. And it's you're trying to compare those two things and make them, um, sorry, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there with the supplement one, but the reductionism, the whole world of reductionism, I'm not going to go into too much. Uh, this is another conversation for another day, but uh, it's, it can be leading us down a path that um, might not have the end result that we want because they're just focused on little micro variables, but not taking a look at the big picture. So it's looking at the tree and not the forest. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you step out, it's like, I have 30 minutes. What am I going to do in this 30 minutes? Are you just going to do eccentric exercises? Well, no, you, you could do eccentrics for maybe two minutes, five minutes, but then you got 25 minutes to do other stuff that will be beneficial. And the other stuff is what we talk about all the time. Uh, okay. So that is the eccentric note. Um, I think we got, it's 122 here. Um, here's what I'm, I'm proposing. Let's answer one more question here. And then I just perhaps talk about uh, the coaching, coaching service, just because uh, I mentioned that earlier. And I know there's going to be people that this will, that will really benefit from this. Thanks, um, so let's jump into looking for a good one that we haven't talked about. Um, Thanks for all the great questions. This is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's lots of good questions. Okay, here's one that I've seen that I don't think we've talked about. Um, my slows is the username. Hi, I developed bilateral shoulder pain last December after using crutches for a few weeks. Oh. MRI shows bursitis in both, tendonitis in the right. Take an anti-inflammatory and still doing rehab, better but still painful. Uh, my question is, since this was bilateral, could the root cause be elsewhere? Uh, so one thing I, I'd like you to talk about maybe crutches for a second, because I'm guessing you have, you've got some experience with that and some, maybe some recommendations. And then the question about bilateral, could the root cause be elsewhere? That's a good question. Um, yeah. Crutches can be really problematic. And, you know, particularly if you have weakness around your shoulder girdles and if we, ha if you have a head forward posture um, and, and one, you have to make sure you're using the crutches properly Um you know, I would advise anybody who has to use, use them to get a, get a little session with the therapist so that you make sure that you're not leaning on the crutches and putting your weight um, on the crutch directly from your shoulder. Actually, you, you need to stabilize your shoulders. You need to have good alignment of your neck and your core when you're using crutches. It's actually a very demanding uh, way of moving around. So for somebody who, you know, hasn't, so somebody who's just sitting at a desk, an office worker, and then getting up and having to be on crutches, it's an extremely demanding um, activity to, uh, for the shoulders themselves. Um, the fact that you had bilateral shoulder pain, uh, it, it, you're using two crutches. It could, be that you've, um, uh, it could be that you're having a problem with your neck as well and some pain radiating from the neck into the shoulders. Um, because the whole shoulder girdle, including the base of your neck and the thoracic spine can be affected. Uh, I think that the, the best thing, if you have to go on crutches is to, it's like a workout. You've got to start slowly. You've got to progress. You've got to, you know, build up your strength and endurance. Um, but all of the, uh, if you, you know, go from zero to a hundred and have to be on crutches and you have head forward carriage, stiff thoracic spine, protracted scapula, you're a sitting duck for getting impingement in your shoulders. So hopefully you're not on the crutches anymore. And uh, even if you are, I would be trying to work on all of these other issues, making sure you've got great alignment of your cervical thoracic spine and, and your, your scapula so that it's not your poor little rotator cuffs and subacromial bursas that are taking your whole body weight through uh, when you're trying to walk. Yeah, that's some great insights there um, with the crutches. So hopefully that uh, that gets 
translated. And if it's a real problem, you can get forearm crutches. So there's different types of crutches if you have to be on crutches. So there's sort of the traditional crutches where you know it's up in your armpit, your axilla, uh, but there are different types of crutches, forearm crutches or a walker so that you can change how you're loading your shoulders if your shoulders are killing you and you still, you've got a fracture in your leg and you need to be on these crutches for months at a time. There are alternatives that you can use, but work on your, work on your shoulders and your upper back while you're waiting for your leg to heal. You know, it's a great little sideshow. <laughs> right on. Okay, everybody, uh, I think for questions, we are out of time. So what I wanted to, to share about was um, Dr. B's coaching consulting service. Um, so I posted the link in the chat for anybody who may be interested in working with Dr. B one-on-one. -on -one. And why don't you, um, let me ask you this, who, who do you think this service would be really good for? Well, I think it's, I think it's great for anybody who say has tried the traditional methods and not got, not just not getting better. Uh, you know, they're going, they're getting treated, they feel good for a short period of time, and then they try to get back to their activity and they get stuck. They're not sure whether they need an operation or not. They have an MRI, there's a little something on the MRI, and do I need an operation? Don't I need an operation? Um, that's where I think I can really help people um, in, first of all, talking with them about their symptoms. I can observe and watch them over Zoom, watch them move, give them tips on what they can do to change how they're loading the part of their body. Talk with them about my experience about the role of surgery so that if they do need it, that they can really understand what they're getting into. Uh, and if they need it, um, how they can best prepare their body to get the best result from their surgery to understand what's the surgery going to do for me versus what do I need to do for my surgery. Um, and, and having that kind of approach, you can get the best results. Um, and then if you've had surgery and you're just not able to get back to your activity the way that you thought you were going to, then I can review with you um, again, how you're moving and, and, and maybe you weren't taken through this approach to begin, approach to begin with. And we've talked about the performance pyramid before where you have to have a foundation for movement and then progress up the pyramid. And I find that there's two main reasons that people have pain. Either they don't have a foundation for movement or they progress up the pyramid too quickly. So I can talk with someone and help them identify where they're at and what they can do to change how they move so that we can make progress. So I think that's, that's kind of, you know, my philosophy is to empower people so that they can understand their body and um, what they can do to keep moving forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just think, you know, if, well, you guys, if you've been coming to these Ask Dr. B live sessions, you you get Dr. B kind of knows what she's talking about. <laughs> and, uh, you. you know, I've, I've had, I've been lucky enough to be able to talk with her more, it's, you know, a lot about the body and movement and the, the approach is just so it's, you can tell that the depth of knowledge and experience of where this approach has come from, but then the practicality of it, of what she cups to, puts together um, and what she'll put together for you, uh, I think would be so, so valuable. Because I, I know I know for a fact, if I had a serious injury where I was considering surgery and and that was maybe an option, I she would be the first person I would talk to or any friends that I had who would ask me, they would be you know, rec directed her way as quickly as possible. Because the sooner that you can get on the recommendations that we should have, the movements uh, that she would recommend for you, the better off. Uh, because if you're leaving this thing and it's, you know, the dysfunctions are starting to continue, then it's it's just going to get harder and harder to reverse that stuff. Um, so uh, I think I share this story a lot. When I first met Dr. B, like one of the, the things she mentioned is 70% of the people that she would see, she would uh, recommend movements and exercises to uh, they would not come back for surgery. They would just cancel their appointment or just not need it and just say, you know what, I'm good. Um, so that's kind of what really drew me to her is that, oh, that's very interesting. An orthopedic surgeon who's got 70% of her patients who are coming to her for surgery, uh, she's diverting from the operating room. 
So, you know, that, that was the, the initial hook that she got me in with. Um, and then investigating that a little further, it, it's just amazing what she can do and how she could help, help you guys out. So that's the, uh, that's the coaching service, the consult coaching or cons consultation service. Um, we've, there's two options, pre-surgery and post-surgery. Um, so check that out if you, if you want to, uh, if you have any of the, or if you fit the, the criteria that, that Dr. Bia just mentioned, I think this is something that uh, would be really, really valuable uh, investment for the, the long-term, because that's, that's our approach. It's the long-term. Yeah. Wow. Okay, everybody, that was a, that was a chock, chock full of information on this one. Hopefully we were able to uh, answer most of your questions. The, the ones that are remaining, they're coming from, they're, they're all very similar. And I feel that we have answered them in some way, shape or form with respect to um, restoring proper movement, getting everything active, getting the tissue moving properly. Um, those are blanket kind of statements that apply to all. And just where you are in the, in that process depends on how severe your injury is or your pain is. Um, but the, the other principle of progression and starting slower rather than too much, start with a little less than a little too much, I think is, is a safe way to, to go about starting with any of our recommendations here. So uh, we will be, I think we're back next week, possibly. Yes, I'm hoping I'm, I'm, 50-50 about whether I may or may not be able to be here next week, but um, I'm not sure quite what we should do, whether we should just have another chat session so that if I'm here, we can uh, just have all comers, all questions. And mm -hmm. I, I think I'll be able to be here. I, I'm very positive that I can be okay. here. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll definitely be here next week, Thursday at noon. Um, maybe me, maybe me and Dr. B, but uh, for sure I'll show up. And if you have any questions, from a more movement perspective, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. So yeah, that okay. is it. That wraps another episode. So thanks again, Dr. B for, for all your time and expertise. And uh, I'll thank you on behalf of everybody here. I, I know that they're, they're gonna be benefiting from this and they're, they're ex expressing their thank yous whether in their head on the keyboard right now. Uh, <laughs> so well, thanks again. And well, it's really fun. And thanks for keeping me online. <laughs> I really appreciate it, Eric. Bye, okay. everybody. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay.